So 28 goes into a little bit more about the 1970s. And so you begin to see the the conflicts and the tensions that we saw bubbling up in the 60s are now going to really kind of come into fruition, become um, very, very kind of significant in the 1970s. Um, and so this, you know, the title of this chapter is The Unraveling. Um, and you can certainly see this. This has picture of the New York City subway and all the graffiti and such. Um, and kind of this idea that uh, the economy was sagging, that many major cities were dealing with a rise in poverty, a rise in crime, um, and places like New York City were really struggling with kind of really what was seen as decay with the subways not working well, with the graffiti being everywhere. Um, and so I think that picture kind of tells you that the implications of uh of the economy and how the economy was struggling with the burdens of the Vietnam War and the Great Society programs, as well as this question about, you know, that Barry Goldwater implied that, oh, we should just let the local governments take care of themselves. We don't need this big government. Well, we've got some big problems going on, right? <laughs> so maybe we do need government. Um, it just kind of depends. Some people would say that government's the reason why the subways look like that. The other one that I wanted to point out is uh, the Stop ERA protest. Um, and you have a lot of conservative women um, that will come up. The Equal Rights Amendment, the ERA, uh, was proposed in the 1970s. It was initially backed by both Republicans and Democrats. And women, you know, was starting to get ratified. And everyone thought, oh, this is going to be smooth sailing. We're going to have an amendment in the Constitution that says women are citizens. You know, it doesn't matter what your sex is. Um, and you have the rise of kind of this conservative movement led by Phyllis Schlafly. So if you go to uh, the extra credit Ed Puzzle videos that I shared with you, um, and so anyways, if you go to those, um, then, you know, you can see, um, you, know, you, you know, there's a video on Phyllis Schlafly and how she stopped the ERA. Um, and so I think that that's pretty interesting if you're wanting to kind of get a sense for, you um, you know, for how effective this particular movement was. Um, and so a lot of conservatives get highly motivated, um, you know, to stop this particular re uh, amendment. Uh, and it does stop uh, and is never not ratified. It's still not ratified to this day. Um, so technically, women have civil rights based on an, an understanding of the 14th Amendment, not because an amendment clearly states um, that we are equal citizens. Um, and so I think that it's interesting um, to recognize these divisions between uh, conservative, between liberal, this, these questions over women and what women's roles are in society. Um, and so that really does a good job of kind of pointing that out. Um, talking about other conflicts. So you have this particular, the report on the National Advisory Commission on Civil Disorders. This is the Kerner Commission um, that I mentioned to you. Um, and this Kerner Commission, of course, is studying uh, uh, the violence that had happened in 1966 and 67 um, and is looking at what's happening. Um, this is our basic conclusion. Our nation is moving toward two societies, one black, one white, separate and unequal. Um, this movement can be re reversed. The choice is still possible. Um, to pursue our present course will involve the continuing polarization of the American community and ultimately the destruction of basic democratic values. The alternative is not blind repression or capitulation to lawlessness. It is the realization of common opportunities for all within a single society. Um, and that we have to, to be compassionate. We have to take action. Um, that we have to, we may have to raise taxes. Um, that we have to attack poverty. We have to attack segregation. What my, white Americans have never fully understood, but what the Negro can never forget, is that white society is de deeply implicated in the ghetto. White institutions created it, white institutions maintain it, and white society condones it. Um, and that it is now time to turn with all the purpose at our command to the major unfinished business of this nation. It is time to adopt strategies for action that will produce quick and visible progress. It is time to make good the promises of American democracy to all citizens, urban and rural, white and black, Spanish surname, American Indian, and every minority group. Um, that 
that we have to undertake these initiatives, that we have to do this right away. So if you put this in context with, say, um, you know, Johnson's speech at Howard University, or if you put this in contrast um, to Barry Goldwater, right, you're talking, the Kerner Commission is calling for this major expansion of government power uh, and government programs um, in order to address these problems. So when, when on one hand, conservatives are talking about, oh my goodness, you know, we've had, you know, you know, there's so much violence in the streets, there's all these protests. What the Kerner Commission is saying is that people are protesting because they're frustrated. And, you know, we, we should be able to choose to do something about that. Um, so you've got this conflict. This is kind of a continuation of this question about the role of government in our lives. How much, what, what does equality, what does opportunity look like? Um, Whose vision of equality and opportunity are we talking about? Um, you know, whose vision of freedom are we talking about? You know, and so it kind of creates a lot of interesting um, kind of issues there. Um, so you have, uh, this is a statement of John Kerry uh, of Vietnam Veterans Against the War. Uh, he's basically talking about, you know, the failures of, uh, of, of, the, Viet of the American intervention in Vietnam, um, that it was basically a civil war that we got in, interfered in, um, that it was never really about democracy versus communism. It was always about Vietnam um, and the uniting of Vietnam um, and that that America had supported a corrupt regime in South Vietnam um, and that because of that, we had lost some of our morality with the sense of my lie um, and, you know, and, and that we've kind of lost our sense of self, right? Um, and that we need to get out of this, that we've glorified these, these body counts, these ideas, um, you know, and, and aren't paying attention to the fact um, that, you know, that this is costing American lives and that this is costing kind of the American moral center, right? Um, and he's criticizing Nixon, who, you know, by 1971 has taken over um, his, uh, taken over the war, and he doesn't want to be the first president to lose, right? And so you have uh, John Kerry saying, well, who's going to be the last man to die? You know, rather than being the first president to lose a war, who's going to be the last man to die in Vietnam? Um, so again, talking about this question again Vietnam is a central piece of conflict um, and being if you put Vietnam and you position it with this Cold War of course you hurt you should have looked at Barry Goldwater talking in, in chapter 27 uh, talking about you know standing up against communism and yet standing up against communism has brought us into the Vietnam War and clearly we see that the Vietnam War is is this area of real severe tension um, and so I think it's kind of interesting to see it in that context. Um, then you've got Richard Nixon's China visit, uh, where he comes on and makes an announcement that he's going to visit China and normalize relations with China. This was quite a big deal. Remember, the U.S. had not really had significant contact with China um, going back to 1882. Um, and so now, despite the fact that they're a communist regime, here is President Nixon choosing to be friendly and make peace with China. Now, um, on one hand, you contrast this with John Kerry's testimony and you can be, well, you know, clearly this war is not about communism if the president's going to be reaching out to China. Um, I do think that it's fair to say that, that reaching out to China is a part of the plan of getting us out of Vietnam um, because if China and the U.S. are friendly and normalizing relations, then China's going to be less inclined to help Ho Chi Minh and the Viet Minh. Um, so th there's a lot of more complicated going on here. But I do think you, you're you talking about the essential conflict about communism, about the Cold War. What kind of Cold War are we going to have? Are we going to have a Cold War that involves killing and shooting people? Or are we going to have a Cold War that involves diplomacy? Um, and how is, how is Nixon going to approach this? And, you know, and the reality is Nixon is a Republican. And so you have a Republican and Nixon reaching out to China when, you know, roughly, you know, seven years before that, you had Barry Goldwater accusing the Democrats of being soft on communism. And yet what we know is that it, it's really because Nixon is a Republican. He was a member of the House and American Activities Committee. He's a hardcore anti-communist. And because of that, he has the credentials to reach across the aisle um, to China to kind of normalize relations. And there's an irony there, kind of this, this inherent inherent, uh, you know, implied contradiction um, that how could that, that the Republicans would then make peace with China. Um, and I think that that makes for a pretty interesting um, kind of 
situation there. Um, this is Barbara Jordan. Uh, she's from Texas. In 1976, she gives an address at the Democratic National Convention uh, where she basically talks about kind of the frustration of the 1970s, um, the sense that we're dealing with some economic crisis. We're dealing with high unemployment. We're dealing with inflation. Um, the videos that are related to the 70s and 80s talk about stagflation um, and, and how that was having an impact. Um, the, the stagflation is the result of, you know, first off globalization, which by the time you get to the 1970s is a real impact. Oil prices are a part of this, the oil embargo in 1973, um, that's going to be a part of the inflation. Uh, you also have, um, increasing, uh, efficiency, uh, with automation taking, having a role, uh, competition from other countries having a role. Um, and then, of course, just the general burdens that we've taken on through the Vietnam War, through the Great Society. So things are pretty complicated in the 1970s. And she's talking about the fact um, that we've kind of, that, that we are in search of our future. We're in search of our national community. Where are we, what are we going to do? You know, we're people trying not only to solve the problems of the present, um, but we are attempting on a larger scale to fulfill the promise of America. Uh, what is our national purpose, right? Uh, that we have to look to the future, um, that we shouldn't fear it, that despite being distrustful of our leaders, um, that we have to go beyond that. We have to become we will that we should not let ourselves uh, become cease to become one nation uh, instead become a collection of interest groups, city against suburb, region against region, individual against individual, each seeking to satisfy private wants. If that happens, who will then speak for America? Who will then speak for the common good? Um, we are we must be bound together by common spirit, by common endeavor or we will, or will we become a divided nation? Um, we, we can't become these new Puritans. Um, you know, we, we must, um, form a national community, right? Um, you know, and that's what we, and she's kind of calling us to that thing and to that higher level. So kind of interesting that in 1976, Barbara Jordan is saying something that could easily be said today, um, in 2019. So this kind of, uh, you know, identity crisis that the U.S. starts to have because of Vietnam um, has continued to this day, right? And so you, you see it in 1976 um, that, you know, public officials have to try to, to serve the public. They must serve the public interest, um, that they have to be willing to admit mistakes, um, you know, that it's going to be challenging, right? But we have to work together. Um, and I think it's really kind of interesting to see her kind of talking about that. But she also makes this reference to kind of this, this what seems to be a crisis, right? Which takes us to Jimmy Carter and his crisis of confidence speech, where he's talking about energy and he's been talking, you know, energy, the energy crisis is tied to the, the OPEC oil embargo and kind of the frustrations with that. Um, and so he's coming out and he's saying, you know, I've been trying to talk to you, um, you know, and I'm, you know, why are we not able to get together and solve our energy problem? Um, and he goes on to say that basically um, that the fundamental threat to our democracy um, is largely because of a crisis of confidence, right? It's a crisis that strikes to the very heart and soul and spirit of our national will. Um, it's a loss of unity of purpose. It's erosion in confidence, um, you know, in those kinds of things that we're losing faith, not only in the government itself, but in the ability as citizens to serve as the ultimate rulers and shapers of our democracy. Um, and you know, that, that, you know, we, too many of us now are more interested in what we want to do and consuming goods. We're not defined by, by doing good for others and, and kind of thinking about other people that we've learned that piling up material goods cannot fill the emptiness of our lives, which have no confidence or purpose. Um, you know, this symptom is all around us, um, that we have this apathy. Two thirds of our people don't even vote. The productivity of American workers is actually dropping and the willingness of Americans to save for the future has fallen below that of all other people in the Western world. Um, and so you really have happening, um, you know, this, this notion in the seventies, um, of, you know, who are we, what are we going to do? And, you know, and if you're talking about the idea of clashes and conflicts, um, you know, Vietnam is a big part of that. And the, the, you know, who are we that we're left with after Vietnam? I think the crisis of confidence that happens with our leaders after Watergate, that's a part of it. Um, 
you know, this idea of how do we how do we handle all these diverse interests, right? How do we handle all these different groups? You've got different groups of people talking about different ideas. Um, you've got the question of opportunity, um, who should have what opportunity and who gets to be the person that decides where that opportunity comes from. Um, and so you've got a series of, of crises happening in the 1970s um, that are part of kind of the U.S. trying to find itself in a lot of ways. And again, you know, it, some of it goes back to conservative versus liberal, big government versus small government, uh, men versus women, black versus whites. So you've got all those kind of divisions, but you've got this fundamental question of do the American values hold up? You know, after our involvement in Vietnam, um, do the American values hold up? Now that we've redefined American society to include all these other groups, how do these American values work now? Um, and, and you really kind of see this backlash that begins to develop in this whole process. Um, so that's chapter 28. So I'm going to stop here and record chapter 29, which is largely about the backlash to the 70s and kind of this sense of who are we really, this kind of identity crisis that America is having, as evidenced by Jimmy Carter and Barbara Jordan, um, even to a different extent by John Kerry. Um, so you could look at this chapter in particular and see a number of different ways where there's conflicts over women, uh, over you know, foreign policy. Are we, you know, are we anti-communist anymore or have we stopped being that? Um, so lots of interesting conflicts and questions that come up.